hi everyone my name is alexander i'm going to be an instructor today and i'm really excited to dive into ai for product management with you so let's get started with today's masterclass and just cover off what we're going to be talking about so first things first we're going to be going through some of the fundamental disruptions that are happening uh, and some that you might not expect to be right around the corner more importantly, we're also going to cover off some low-level information around what are AI, what is LLMs, what are tokens, how do neural networks work, um, and these are the foundational sets of knowledge that you can build upon as you bring AI into the product management context and ultimately into the products that you do manage. Uh, we're going to learn about some of the implications of what AI is going to do for product managers, uh, not only in how you can embed that that capability into your products, but moreover, how you can use it to become a better product manager. Uh, and we're going to look at a bit of a, a some of the tooling and some of the landscape uh, that's out there that's really, really great. Now, at the end of this, uh, at the end of the uh, masterclass, we're going to be sending out a cheat sheet, uh, which will have some of these resources available for you uh, and a little bit of extra information. Uh, and that's going to be absolutely excellent. Um, and uh, if you do have questions, feel free to ask them along. We'll get to them all the way at the end. Uh, but before we get into it, just know that today we are not going to be talking uh, l really specific details. We're going to give you a really high level foundational set of knowledge that you can use to uh, get a good sense of what it is that you want to be doing with AI in, uh, in product management. Uh, if you do want to learn a little bit more about how you can implement and improve your productivity as a product manager, you're gonna to have to join us in July with GT, who's gonna be talking through that. Uh, and then come back in August for our third uh, masterclass series uh, for how we actually get hands-on and start talking about when and where and how to integrate AI into your products. Uh, and then in September, we're gonna be doing another great masterclass. You're gonna to have to stay tuned for that one. So uh, let's talk about who I am. Uh, this is me, hi, I'm Alexander. Uh, I have a background in product management. Uh, entrepreneurship and uh, and I've done a lot of uh, um, a lot of product pro projects across the software space and some of the emerging technology spaces in AR and VR. Um, so in my career, early career, um, I was involved in kind of day one of special computing, built some AR retail displays for some pretty big toy companies, uh, created a, a retail space uh, that showcased emerging technology in the center of London down in Shoreditch. Uh, and actually had a, uh, a rare opportunity to meet the Prince of Wales at the time, now King of England, uh, when I did an AR project for 1,700 people at the O2 Arena. So it was absolutely fantastic. So let's get into a little bit about what the kind of fundamental disruption that's coming along. Now, we've all heard about AI. We all know that it's a thing. It's going to disrupt the world. It's going to fundamentally change it. Might have put us out of a job. I don't think so. But at least people are saying that. But there is one set of fundamental disruptions that's coming right behind uh, AI that we probably as product managers need to kind of have in the back of our heads. And that is, of course, spatial computing. Now, when we talk about uh, creating new products right now, especially in the digital context in web uh, and applications, uh, we usually talk about them in a 2D context. We talk about where does the... Uh, the screen, what does the screen look like in an X and Y axis? Where do we put the button? How's the user experience going to kind of flow? And what's the inputs that the users need to provide? And those are primary the keyboard and mouse or on a mobile and tablet, we're kind of touching and, um, and poking and sliding. But ultimately, uh, one thing that we all need to know as product managers is that within five years, spatial computing is going to be one of the primary ways, if not the primary way, that will interact with digital content. Uh, and when we add a Z axis um, to our interfaces, it's going to fundamentally change the way that we interact with our products. And that's a really important thing to consider because when you're talking about um, upskilling yourself uh, as a product manager, and, and if you're just getting started in the product management space, you can really set yourself aside uh, and apart and differentiate yourself as a, as a leader of the pack by really thinking about what is the impact of this new technology, this new way of interacting, and this new way of actually engaging with digital content? And when you layer spatial computing in with AI, you can see that we're actually going to get to this place where the outcomes are going to be absolutely phenomenal. So what does spatial computing look like today? Um, I thought I would just grab a quick video. I don't know if anyone's seen this before, but this is the Spacetop G1. And this is a prototype uh, laptop that is spatial. Um, you put the headset on, and as you can see in the video there, uh, the screen just appears in your face. 
Now, people are still interacting with it with a keyboard and mouse because it's quite natural and we don't have a massive ecosystem of applications that use gesture and natural interface. But we can see that this is going to be a stepping stone towards what is going to be an incredible transition towards purely spatial computing. Uh, and this is around today. You can actually pre-order this. This is um, uh, called the Spacetop G1. But it really begs the question, in a world where spatial computing and AI are present, what is that going to do to the way that we have to design our interfaces? And how are we going to layer information into the real world? And what, more importantly, how does users going to interact with that? And what is their journey and their experience going to look like? So this is just one thing I want to put on your radar. As product managers, you need to be really, really mindful that we have this huge wave of disruption coming with AI and its incredible capability to apply intelligence at a machine level to all of the tasks in your product and adding value to your end customer. But one of the things you really want to be thinking about is that's not the only set of disruption that's coming in the next five years. We're going to see this fundamental shift in the way that we're going to engage with that data. So it's definitely something you want to keep in the back of your head. But I know you're all here for AI, so we'll move on to that. But before we do, let's have a quick chat about some stuff that's happening in the market. Has anyone else heard about this not no, this notion that product management is in decline and that companies like Facebook are sacking all their product managers. And I'm here to tell you today that is not the case. It's very much not true. Um, but what you are seeing is that the name of product managers is changing, but their function is essentially the same. Ultimately, uh, on the left here, we have a job ad from Facebook uh, from 2014. And on the right, uh, you have a job ad for a technical program manager uh, from this year. Now, I've highlighted almost word-for-word -word copies of what elements of the job ad from 2014 are in today's job ad and how those two roles um, overlap. And you'll actually notice that product management is a key facet to every single part of uh, a technical program manager. And, and therefore, if you upskill and are um, just joining into the product management community or just um, deciding for a career change, don't stress, these are great roles that you're going to be able to access um, going into the future. So it's a really, really exciting time. And don't believe the hype around product management and decline. It is very much the opposite. We are all going to be here very, 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 very soon uh, for a very long time. So let's get into a little bit of AI. Now, we've all heard of chat GPT. We've all heard of open AI. We've all heard of these incredible LLMs that are just absolutely spitting out content like no tomorrow. Uh, but I have a, a quick question for everyone. Uh, and that is, when was the first AI invented? So if you want to throw uh, uh, your answers into the chat, we can do that. Um, and let's see if anyone has a really good understanding. We've got 1945 in the 60s, 1998. Um, sometime in the 50s is bang on. So 1952 was actually the first year that AI was invented. Um, the concept of AI, artificial intelligence, was used to create a checkers game. Strangely enough, that was the game of the, the, the decade. Uh, and someone used a computer to essentially have AI play itself in checkers. Uh, and that was revolutionary at the time. Um, but if you come to think about it, uh, we have come a very long way since 1952. So we're almost... Uh, we're, we're now into a new century, new millennium. We've got completely different culture, completely different set of technology. Uh, and as such, um, what was the inflection point that led us from 1952 to today uh, and why we are now very much talking about AI? And that uh, that really starts in 1997 uh, with Dick Dragon Dictate. I don't know if anyone used that application. You could talk to it uh, and it would dictate straight into your your uh, your 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 PC uh, and allow you to actually grab a, uh, a, a sound bite and turn that into text. Um, and that was really cool. But realistically, modern AI uh, was actually invented in 2017. So there was a, a paper, a research paper by DeepMind, which is um, now owned by Google. It's called Google, called Google Brain now. Uh, and it's called uh, Attention is All You Need. And this is the, the research paper that introduced the concept of the generative pre-trained transformer. So if you're wondering, GPT in chat GPT stands for generative pre-trained transformer. So 2017 was when it all changed. 
Um, I, and, and if uh, you want a little bit of fun uh, background information, uh, Lucas Kulzer, one of the original authors of the paper, actually works now at OpenAI as a, a data researcher there. Um, but ultimately, it took uh, just over seven years to go from, um, uh, sorry, just over five years to go from uh, 2017's um, uh, initial paper to uh, the launch of the first commercially viable um, LLM. Uh, and that was with GPT launching in November of 22. Uh, and ultimately, what we can see is that um, the pace of innovation and the pace of change for these LLMs is rapidly increasing. But it's really important as product managers that you get a really good fundamental understanding of, of this technology. So you don't buy into the marketing buzzwords. You don't get sucked in to uh, the, the, all of the hype that, that's going on in, in the market. You get down to the core fundamental truth. And that's some of the things we're going to cover off today. So let's talk about some of the, uh, the things I firmly believe, and I hope you all agree with me. Um, is that within five years, uh, AI is going to make a fundamental change in the way that we produce products. Uh, one of those fundamental changes is that um, AI will, in many respects, replace human engineers. Uh, and as such, we'll get to a place where product managers are ultimately going to be responsible for defining what goes into a product and what it should do. Uh, and then an AI will execute on that. And uh, for anyone that is already in product management and is upskilling uh, and has worked with in the, in the product management context, you know that working with dev teams can be quite challenging and the timelines for execution can go from days, weeks, months, and years. Um, and there's always points of failure across that entire process. So as AI starts to take over the heavy lifting of how products get built, we're going to start to see this onus coming back to product managers on what actually goes into a product. And it's going to be our roles in the future to really clear to find what a product should do, taking into account all of the, uh, the key variables that we do as product managers, taking into account the key customer, the ultimate problem you're trying to solve, and then making sure you're creating the right solution to solve those problems. Uh, in doing so, when we actually have AI engineers, we're going to see this kind of death of point SaaS solutions. Why would you need a Calendly uh, and pay for a Calendly subscription when you can just have an AI build the exact same thing for you? Um, and as such, we're actually going to see this exponential increase in the amount of custom apps that will be built, which is great for us as product managers because those products are going to need to be managed. Uh, and as such, we're going to see this world where um, AI just commoditizes software in a really meaningful way. It will create uh, a very small barrier to the execution and the creation of it. And as such, the quantity of that, um, that software will absolutely explode. We saw this in, uh, in the birth of SaaS as a software category um, when we saw that uh, the um, data services like data cloud, uh, cloud, cloud hosting and cloud uh, data centers um, came, into, came into existence in kind of 2014, 2015. Um, we saw that a massive explosion in SaaS companies that came off the back of that. And that's because no one needed to actually manage a server internally anymore. They could just outsource it to a, a, an AWS or an Azure. Um, but ultimately, I think that uh, one of the things that's really great about humans is we never always want to give up control to something like AI. And therefore, product managers will always have a place in this product context. It's just about us now upskilling to get a really good understanding of what you want to be doing with those, those LLMs and exactly how they're going to operate and what you need to what you need to essentially do in your products to add that ultimate end value. So uh, we've got AI. And it's a big, broad term. Um, and ultimately, uh, I've took a quick screenshot. Anyone know um, Hugging Face? If you don't know Hugging Face, it's a, a repository of open source uh, models uh, all across the AI and machine learning kind of spectrum. Um, so Hugging Face is a great resource if you want to go and find a very specialized open source model, or if you want to find a model that you can then train with your own proprietary data. Um, so uh, everyone's probably heard, or if you haven't, um, if, you're, if you've heard of Facebook releasing the Llama 3 model, that's an open source model. It's available on Hugging Face. You can download that. You can also look at all of the other um, models that people have trained. But I brought this slide up because I wanted to just plant in everyone's mind that LLMs and the text generation outputs of uh, the GPTs, the chat interface of the world, they're a very small section of the total machine learning and artificial intelligence context or the different types of models. Um, obviously, you've seen uh, chat GPT-4 
kind of become multimodal. So it introduces other aspects of other models with um, image generation and code generation and file reading. Um, and these are all other models that are, are being applied to one singular um, interface. But ultimately, um, this is uh, this is a, a great resource for you to kind of go and look at some of the other areas of, of machine learning. Because when you do eventually get around to applying machine learning and artificial intelligence into your application, and you want to be really specific about how you do it, you're probably going to need to um to to take it in in house and and do some open source stuff with it. Um, so let's now have a quick. Uh, discussion around tokens. So uh, ultimately, LLMs um, are, are output something called tokens. Now, it's really interesting that not many people know what tokens genuinely are and uh, and how they're processed. So ultimately, um, we have uh, a token is a parameter. These two terms are interchangeable. So when you hear about these models that are 2 billion parameters or 4 trillion parameters, um, you're actually talking about tokens. That's how many tokens there are. Um, and ultimately, these tokens are, uh, are a way for you to, um, for the model to provide an output, but also to figure out how, uh, how to create the logic or how to create the outcome. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly share my screen and I'm going to give you, uh, I'll, I'll go to my next slide and then we'll, we'll jump into the screen. So um, in essence, a token is essentially a vocabulary that's used by the, the machine learning model or the LLM. Uh, and these tokens are kind of important to know, uh, but it's really about betting in a, a fundamental understanding because when you come around to training your own models with your own proprietary data, what you're essentially doing is creating tokenized um, data and that is ultimately the end goal of uh, the training outcome is you're creating these tokens and you're creating the weights and the biases within the model to figure out how to navigate through a model and understand what those tokens are. So I've got these uh, two little screens and we'll do a really quick demo of, of what this is. Um, and I'll just pull up my page here and let's go. There we go. So this is a great little website you can have a play with. Um, it'll be in the cheat sheet for you to, to have a go with. Let me just pull my head down here. Um, so this is Tokenizer. Uh, what you can see here is um, some text on the left here, uh, and this is it broken up into tokens. And here's the token IDs, and this is for the chat GPT, GPT-4 model. Um, now, if we add some extra words like what is a token, um, ultimately, uh, what we're going to see is we're going to see these extra little IDs kind of popping up everywhere. Now, uh, on the right here, um, you can see that uh, I'll just switch to this other one. We're just going to grab this number here, 4037. And we're going to have a look at GPT's entire vocabulary, and we're actually going to search for it here. So we're going to search for token. And ultimately, what a token is, and I, it's a bit meta me using the word token to describe what a token is, but a token is a way that the LLM refers to something. And as you can see, we have 4037, and that is the ID for the token, which is token. But you can see that there's multiple other tokens here in all the different variations. Uh, and ultimately what this is, is as the model was trained, it broke up all of the content on all the data that was giving into it and broke it into its small little component part, parts and figured out what's the right weighting and the what's the right biases to be able to say, okay, I know what you're talking about and here's an output that's contextually relevant. Um, and this is, uh, this is something important to understand because a lot of people think that these modern LLMs are probabilities. It's just these big probability tables. It's not. Um, these are these tokens and, um, uh, and these tokens are, are, are very much uh, and uh, fundamental to um, how these, these LLMs work. And it's worth uh, just spending a little bit of time getting a fundamental understanding of, of what it is. So let me come back to the slides for a second because we're just going to move on to this next slide here, which is what is a, 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 a convolutional neural network, a CNN, or a, in modern days, an ANN, which is an artificial neural network, look like? What does it actually look like? Um, so there's a great resource you can actually have a play around with. And this should hopefully help you really contextually understand um, how these LLMs and how these AIs are actually working at their foundational level. And again, this is going to be really, really useful for when you want to apply um, really deep knowledge uh, to your own product sets and your own data proprietary data sets, uh, because then you can figure out exactly how to, to apply this. This is what data scientists will do, but as product managers, it's always good to have a, a pretty good understanding. So we're going to come back to 
uh, a page now. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick example of a, an LLM. Now, everyone's seen those slides where you've got the input nodes, you've got these hidden layers, and you've got the output nodes, right? If you haven't, just quickly Google, like, what does an LLM look like? And you'll find those on Google. But this is a really great interface that you can actually have a play around with. And you actually can really see what the, the training process looks like. So as you can see, we have our input data over here. Um, and we have our hidden layers. Right now, there's two hidden layers. And we have our output. Um, and as such, I'm going to just run some training. Uh, and you can see what the LLM is trying to do is it's trying to say, cool, I want to make sure that all the blue dots are in the blue blue color and all the orange dots are in the are, are, are in the orange color. And as you can see, uh, the training loss, which means accuracy, uh, is now at zero. But that's really easy. Let's try a different pattern. And let's have a quick look at what this looks like. So you'll notice that with very little data, and we've heard, you've probably heard that LLMs need lots of data to be trained. And if you've got proprietary data sets, it's really important. Um, ultimately, what this, uh, what this should demonstrate is that the more data you have and the bigger the, the model, um, the more accurate it can become in terms of how it, it, it derives the, the outcome. So what you can see here is these are iterations of the model training through. Uh, and I know I'm getting really technical, but trust me, it's worth learning. Um, and if we pause that for a moment, we can actually have a quick look at the weightings. So when people talk about weightings and biases, what does it mean? Um, and weightings are essentially the relationship between two different nodes you know, or two different um, parameters within a uh, within an LLM. Now, right, what we're doing with this is essentially image um, classification. We're just moving data around to make sure that all the blue dots and all the orange dots are in the same uh, areas. And what you'll start to see is that as we increase the amount of data we throw at it, we're going to get a better outcome. Uh, and it's going to start looking a lot closer to what we want. But you'll notice it's probably not going to get all the way there. Uh, and that's primarily because if we have a look at what each of these neurons are doing, or each of these kind of parameters are doing, is they're deeply specializing in a specific shape. Uh, and therefore, once you combine those shapes, um, you get the output. And that's essentially how LLMs work. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put it out of its misery and we're going to add a few extra hidden layers. We'll add a few neurons. And what this is looking like is um, a, uh, a five neuron deep, four hidden layer, very small parameter um, model. So let's have a look at how quickly this can now train. Um, and ultimately, what you can see is the more data you put in and the bigger the model, um, the more parameters it has the faster the training becomes and the better the outcome becomes. So as you can see, it's now slowly moving around. We can see the training loss, test loss. It's going to spike up a bit. And that's the model trying to figure out. And this is what training is. There's tr billions and billions of dollars spent by the companies like OpenAI and Anthropic to train these models. Uh, and this is what they're doing. But they're doing it on a massive scale with way more complicated data. And it's important for us as product managers to understand that this data right over here, these are just mathematical functions. This is X1, X2, X3, sine X2. Um, but ultimately, when you have your own proprietary data set, uh, what this will allow you to do is actually get to um, a, a really, really valuable um, AI model that you can use for your own products really, really quickly. And it comes down to a, a combination of what quality data you're putting in uh, and then how big is that that model that you're actually using. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to start from scratch. As I mentioned, Hugging Face earlier, they have a lot of these models uh, and, uh, and the technical hurdle to actually perform this training is really not as high as it used to be. Um, so uh, ultimately... Well, the outcome of what a model is, if you actually re really want to know what a model is, uh, is really just these weights and these biases. So um, all of the weights uh, talking about a positive weight is is that's definitely something we want or a negative weight is not something you don't want. Um, so it's really just the relationship between all of these different neurons. So if you think now back to tokens, let's tie it all together. Uh, if you think of each one of these neurons as a token and the input is some text, um, as the text makes its way through the uh, through the model, all of the weights and the biases say, okay, well, I know what this word is. I know what this token is. I know where it should be. And this is what I think the next word should be based on um, on, on uh, where that model has, has been trained and how it's been trained. And that's briefly, roughly, very poorly, an explanation of how uh, LLMs work. 
Um, but again, you can have a play with these all by yourself um, at TensorFlow, playground.tensorflow.org. Um, so that is, uh, it's quite a few years old now, but uh, it's probably one of the best examples um, that you can kind of just conceptually wrap your head around how these models are working. Um, so let's now talk about the next aspect of uh, AI and uh, and what what's 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 the change? What's really happening here? And we hear about these models getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Um, and we hear about these context windows getting bigger. What is what is a context window and why is that important? Um, and more importantly, why are they, why are they increasing at an exponential rate? Um, and context windows is essence how many tokens a model can process at any one point. Um, and what you can find is that the bigger the context window, the more data you can give the model in one instance or one, um, one pass, and the more the model can actually process in a single um, run through the model. Uh, and ultimately, um, the bigger the context window, the more input data it can take. And context, just like with humans, um, if you don't give a model enough context around what problem you're trying to solve, uh, it's not going to understand what you're actually asking of it. Um, and therefore, the bigger the context window, the better these models are getting. Now, uh, when we started in kind of 2020 uh, with GPT-3 or even GPT-2, the context windows were about 2K um, or 2,000 tokens. And if you roughly average out a token, it works out to be almost four to five characters, some more, some less. Um, but ultimately, we've seen that token size or that that window of how much information these these uh, LLMs can process rapidly expanding. Uh, and this is going from 2,000 tokens in 2020 all the way to a million tokens today in 2024. Uh, and this has happened very quickly. Uh, and what you'll start to see is that we're going to get to a point where the token or the context window of these LLMs is so large that it's just not going to matter anymore. You're just going to be able to pass it so much information. It's just going to be able to spit things out. Um, now, we're not going to cover off uh, RAG, which is a retrieval augmented generation, which is one of the techniques that product managers and, and engineers can use to embed into a model additional context. Uh, we'll cover that later in a, one of our later masterclasses um, further down in the series. But today, I just wanted to kind of put on your radar that Context windows is something you really want to be paying attention to because ultimately it is a very important aspect of what makes these models so incredibly powerful uh, in addition to their contextual reasoning and their, their ability to generate really, really awesome outcomes. Now, engineers have benefited from AI for quite some time and us product managers, we've kind of been left out of this incredible innovation. Uh, that was part of my motivation for starting uh, the product that I'm building at the moment. But uh, I wanted to bring to your attention that these, these AI um, kind of tooling is already in the product process. It's already in aspects of the product management process. So it's going to be really important for us as product managers to deeply understand um, how we can implement these tools. Because uh, engineers have had GitHub Copilot and there's a, a, new, a new web um, interactive development environment called Cursor that's come out, which is embedded with an LLM. Um, but ultimately, product managers, we're, we're stuck using Jat GPT. Now, uh, when you actually look at that current process, and we're going to spend a bit of time here uh, looking at this one. Um, ultimately, when you get through uh, the entire product process, I'm just going to move my head uh, just down here. Um, so if we have a look at the entire product process, um, all the way from customer research to kind of developing those strategies and objectives, um, generating those roadmaps to kind of build out the the what we're going to do and how we're going to solve the the problems and meet those those strategic objectives. We then go and gather requirements. We write the Jira tickets. We prioritize a backlog. We do technical spiking. If you look at every single step in the product management process, um, you can see that every one of these areas, you're going to be able to apply AI to each individual step. And in aggregate, you're going to be able to rapidly improve the product de development process um, and product management process in, in general. And, and it's important when you're looking at how um, these current processes work, uh, because right now there's often disparate systems. Um, there's quite a lot of cross-functionality in your teams. You'll work with designers, you work with engineers, you work with business analysts, you work with um, other key stakeholders. 
Uh, and not all, not everyone kind of talks on the same level. Uh, and ultimately, when you try as a product manager to consolidate all of that information in one place, it's typically quite a difficult task. And what AI is going to do for us as product managers is, is going to be able to systematically target each one of these areas of the product management process and really improve it in many, many ways. Um, so if you look at how I've broken this up, we kind of have this, in what I call the why. It's the definition of why. What, what are we, why are we doing something and what is it? So we've got our customer research at the top there. Um, and this kind of comes down to a point where we go, right, what does this look like with designs? How is this documented with tickets? Uh, and if you can start thinking about all of the tasks that you need to do in terms of that development pro uh, that product management process, you can really just target each individual step with the AI um, and generate outcomes that you probably would not have gotten to by yourself or have you can speed up rapidly. Um, but I do have a prediction for everyone. I, I genuinely think we're going to start to see a decline in things like sprints um, because as processes and and um, and AI starts kind of executing for us, we're going to kind of not have to break our work up and, and chunk it as much as we do currently. And therefore, we're probably going to get rid of sprints eventually. Maybe, maybe not quite controversial, I know. Um, but ultimately, if you get you do away with sprints, then there goes the sprint planning session, there goes the retro. Uh, and this is going to free up a lot of time for product managers to really just focus on listening to that customer, understanding that customer problem. And these are the kind of awesome things that are coming for product managers in, in the AI and, and generative AI world. Um, ultimately, we're going to get to a place where you're going to be able to really rapidly understand exactly what's been built. And that feedback loop is going to be there. Um, we've started to see developers using tooling that informs product managers of exactly what they've built and what the implications are. And that flows back up. So we kind of talked, I talked a little bit about that consolidation of information. And this is really what I mean is each one of these kind of AI tools. And when you are looking at embedding AI tools, just make sure that you are looking at the aggregate and how each of those individual tools at every step in the process is adding ultimate value to you as a product manager and ultimately to the end customer uh, and the organization that you work with or for. Um, so this is a really, really interesting area um, that that I think that there's going to be quite a lot of um, uh, focus on over the next few years. Uh, and for anyone just starting out, this is a great time to get into product management because at the end of the day, um, AI is never going to be held accountable um, and is never going to be uh, uh going to be able to be held accountable to uh, for what it does. So there's going to have to be someone that sits there and says, this is what the AI needs to do. And has it done it? Yes. Okay. I'm going to take responsibility for that. And that's ultimately where product managers are going to start to live. And it's going to be a great, great place to stay. So uh, we'll just quickly talk now about um, AI product, uh, like how, how we're going to be uh, kind of applying AI to product management. And I've kind of talked to this, but I'll, I'll kind of re-summarize it. I'll just move my head again. Um, I'll resummarize it back into this, this, uh, this, these kind of two core categories. So if we think about the role of a product manager today, it's really broken up into the kind of strategic activities where you're engaging with your stakeholders, be it C-suite or your chief product people or your key customers. Um, it's about bringing your entire organization along and aligning people around what the product's doing and bringing them behind that vision, communicating that vision, making sure that people know what's coming, when it's going to get there and why that's really important so that sales and marketing can go out and sell it and market it. Uh, and then really just driving that, uh, that focus on, on, on value proposition. So if you think about those as those kind of key strategic activities that product uh, managers do. Um, in the alternate, in the, in the flip side, we've got the tactical stuff. And this is where PMs, uh, depending on the size of your organization, if you're lucky enough to have BAs and you don't have to do the scoping yourself, um, then awesome. But a lot of PMs spend a bunch of their time actually documenting scope and writing out instructions for engineers um, and prioritizing that backlog and, and grooming that backlog and just syncing through it. Uh, managing the devs and making sure that the answers, uh, questions are getting answered and that, and that all of that is getting, being communicated to key stakeholders within the organization. You're going to start to see a lot of this tactical um, role uh, fade away with AI kind of replacing or um, augmenting a lot of those tactical activities. And it's going to allow us as product managers to really focus on that strategic activity and really drive in exactly what it is that we're doing uh, to, to move the product forward, ultimately move the organization forward and add value to that, that end customer. 
So uh, I know I've been waffling on a little bit about these these kind of or areas, but I did want to uh, kind of round out just this this uh, this um, masterclass with a couple of things that you can try at home. So uh, I'm going to circle back to the the original thing that I spoke about with spatial computing and the disruption that's coming. And what does that look like? And how are we going to interact with products in the future? And as such, I wanted to give you a quick demonstration um, of Hume. Has anyone seen Hume before? Uh, and if you have, Awesome. If you've seen it at home, excellent. Um, but this is Hume. So let's have a, a quick look at Hume. Oh, it's very busy. Uh, it's absolutely getting smashed. So let's see if we can't get back in. We'll just keep trying. Um, whoop, come on, you can do it. Uh, but Hume is essentially an AI that is uh, around um, empathic. So hi, Hume. My name is Alexander, and I'm giving a masterclass on AI product management. Uh, just one second, folks. I've just occurred to me that we don't have audio for you. So I'm just going to add that in. All right, let's try that again. Uh, now, hopefully you can hear this. Um, this is Hume. This is an empathic AI interface. So Hume, hi, my name is Alexander. Can you tell me about what an empathic voice interface is? Well, hello there, Alexander. I'm Evie, an empathic voice interface created by Hume. The idea behind it is to have AI that can really tune in to how you're feeling and respond accordingly with the right tone, emotional intelligence, and just the right amount of personality. Fascinating stuff, Alexander. It's absolutely fascinating, Hume. Can you please tell me with what I'm saying, what my emotional state is? Uh, I see your excitement shining through, Alexander. And I detect the hint of concern or distress mixed in there too. Let me try to tune into your emotional state a bit more. So it's very hard to uh, do a demo with this tech, um, but that's Hume, that's uh, an AI interface. Uh, that actually detects the emotional state of the user based on the inflection in their voice. Uh, and as product managers, can you imagine what we can do when we can understand the emotional state of our customers while they're using our product and how that's going to work with us? So that's Hume. Um, you can have a quick look at demo.hume.ai. I'll throw that in the cheat sheet. Have a play with it. Uh, it's got a great API interface that you can use. Um, but that is one of the great tools. Another one that I did want to get you all to have a quick look at is Olama. Olama is a, a fantastic interface uh, tool to run local models on your own device. So if you are concerned about your data leaving your ecosystem or your company or wherever you're uh, operating, and you don't want to send it off to an API, you don't want to send it to a third party, no problem. Head over to Hugging Face, download a model um, run it via Olama. The instructions are really simple and you can have your own chat interface directly on your device. None of your data is leaving your machine. Um, I love this. Whenever I take a flight, I run this locally on my laptop and I can use AI to do stuff while I'm I'm, I'm in the air. So um, that's, uh, that's all that we've got time for right now uh, for the presentation. Um, I am going to, uh, I am going to take some questions. I've seen quite a few questions coming in. Um, and uh, and if you do have someone throw in, uh, if you do have any other comments, uh, questions, throw them in the comments uh, below, and we can we can kind of come back to you on those. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for joining. We're going to go through some of the the questions now uh, and uh, and get straight into it. So let me just see if we have uh, any awesome questions. So the first is, how are non technical PMs supposed to compete with those engineers who get pushed into PM space by the advent of AI taking over their roles? Um, this is a great question. Uh, we're actually going to see a bunch of folks um, who are product managers 
uh, uh, who are engineers moving into that product management space. But ultimately, I don't think product engineers are going to go away. I think that they're just going to move into other areas of software engineering um, and the web interface uh, stuff that AI can do really, really well is, is not going to be a problem. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, product management in the future is, is going to become a very human uh, human focused um, uh, profession. You are going to have to understand your key stakeholders. You're going to have to bring them along for the journey. You're going to have to engage with them um, and make sure that they understand exactly what the product's doing and how it's working. Uh, and ultimately, uh, these are not skill sets that typical engineers have. Those soft skills that product managers are known for um, uh, and that are core to the product management role, um, these are areas where many engineers do fail. And as such, they may have great technical knowledge, but when the technical knowledge isn't necessary, you're going to find that the problem flips back to humans and how humans engage with the problem and uh, and the human problems around creating products. Um, and ultimately, I do think that for product managers just getting started today, if you don't have a product management background, um, awesome. If you're coming to product management with a domain expertise somewhere else, if you were a lawyer or if you worked in hospitality or if you work somewhere else in customer support, um, these are all great areas of expertise that you can layer into your product management kind of function. Uh, and ultimately, um, as AI takes over and starts to, to kind of replace engineers, um, we're going to see that that subject matter expertise, that domain knowledge, that real world understanding of how things actually happen for real people, um, that's going to be incredibly valuable and that's going to be a real great differentiator. So we're going to start to see uh, more competition in the product management space coming from people who are subject matter experts. And as such, you can all get ahead right now by deeply understanding how AI works in that product management context uh, and really just driving yourself to understand how you fit into the world, where your unique skill sets are, what your unique life experience is, and then applying that to the product management process enabled and facilitated by AI. So ultimately, I think that um, I wouldn't be too worried about the engineers coming back in. Uh, that's that's definitely not what I'd be concerned about. I'd be more concerned about just making sure you upskill yourself in those soft skills um, and really just driving a really great outcome in terms of understanding that customer problem and understanding what those, those customers genuinely need and sorting through the noise and getting to the signal. So uh, next question we have is, um, how much of a context window does spatial information data take given the fidelity required of the data and it's moved to spatial interactions. Great question. Um, <clears throat> so if we think about uh, coding right now, it's um, we give computers instructions on how to render things in two dimensions with an X and a Y um, axis. Uh, and you'll see that uh, many games, like if you look at the software engineering sp uh, space in game development, um, especially the very large 3D games, uh, it's almost it's almost the same. Um, and as such, the the data difference in terms of the amount of data it's going to take is not going to be that much greater. Um, it's it's actually going to be uh, an incremental step. It's not going to be a huge fundamental step change up. Uh, but what it does do is it does change, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, it does change that uh, fundamental kind of way that we're going to interface with with our products of the future and really fundamentally um, how we're going to how, how those user experiences are going to take place. Uh, and it's really important when you're building an application, if it's like a something that's used on site in a construction context, or if it's a, something used in a warehouse, or even if it's just an application that helps you navigate somewhere or make a delivery or whatnot, um, you're going to have to start to figure out what does that user and that human need to be able to have digital information overlaid into the real world and what's going to add the most value. Uh, and sometimes less is more. So you'll find that with spatial computing, just overlaying additional information is, is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so ultimately, yeah, I think, uh, I think that the context windows um, are definitely increasing right now for LLMs. And if you talk, if you go and have a look at, at what people are doing in the games industry with um, LLMs, it's, it's quite phenomenal. Uh, and as such, uh, as those contact windows get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, um, we're going to start to see more improvements in every area, not just spatial and, and games, um, but also what we can do with web technologies. So I think it's going to be uh, it's it's going to be pretty great. Um, so we'll I'll just quickly come down to uh, another one here, which is will the value and pay of PMs going to decrease as AI kicks in? Um, 
That's uh, that's that's a hard one, but I genuinely don't think so. I think we're going to see um, there's going to be way more roles for product management, I believe, in the future. Uh, and it comes back to that that notion that when you have an AI that can just generate stuff really quickly, ultimately someone's going to have to be responsible for what that product does. It's going to have to be someone in the organization that's I'm responsible for that product. Um, and uh, and as such, those people they're going to be responsible for in some cases, almost the entire revenue of, uh, of product led companies. And therefore you're going to see really great, um, value placed on that individual. And as such pay is going to reflect that. So I, d I don't think it's going to decrease. I, I definitely think unless you upskill and, and start to really learn how to leverage these tools, um, you may, you may get beat out by someone who, who does learn how to use these tools, but ultimately I don't, I don't see, uh, the, the PM kind of role going away. That said, I'm probably a little biased in this respect. So uh, I, I take 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 my kind of view here with a, a pinch of salt. Um, so I'll move on to the next question here, which is uh, from uh, Tom. Uh, whilst I get that AI can deliver significant value in removing elements of the tactical requirements of the PM role, would, um, excuse me, <clears throat> Would the prospective impact on strategic requirements be limited by potential security, IP protections, mandates, et cetera, uh, uh, i.e. protect uh, requirements to protect IP or research that fuels organizational products? Um, yeah, absolutely. So when I talked about that ultimate uh, role being responsible for how these, these AIs are going to execute, um, we're definitely going to see that uh, as AI removes some of that technical aspect or and I say when I say remove it's not going to remove it it's just going to make it so fast that it's no longer a time sink it's not something that you require um, and if you have a tool like uh, that can rapidly scope out a feature and it knows that you work in finance and you have to be regulated under the Prudential Financial Authority um, you can actually have uh, all of those regulations embedded straight into the model. And when it's generating those requirements, it's already taking into account those security and those IP protection mandates uh, and those things that are, are essential in that product. Uh, and this is where that tactical um, is going to be enhanced in a material way uh, and actually become less of a part of the product manager role of the future. And ultimately, it's that uh, uh, enablement that product, uh, that AI is going to give to product managers, it's going to allow us to spend more time on that strategic activity because we'll still get collateral, we'll still get the artifacts, we'll still get the outcomes necessary as though we had done that tactical work, but it's just going to be generated by AI because a lot of it is repetitive, it's formulaic, it's quite mundane in some respects. Um, in others, it does require a lot of creativity. And there may be times where PMs will just have to throw the creative hat on and then use an and wield an AI to and shape it to do what it is that they want. Um, so it's really, really exciting uh, where where I think product is is going in in the next five years or maybe ten years, but most likely five years. And how AI is going to impact that change. Um, so it's a great time to be getting into product management. Uh, and uh, and uh, the guys at Fourth Rev are, are doing a great job, of kind of helping to accelerate people in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to take a quick drink here before I move on to the next question. And uh, this one comes from Darren. Um, uh, I mentioned the human skills remaining and becoming more important, but you've also demoed empathic abilities of Hume. Will empathic AI not encroach on PM soft skills too? Um, yes and no. Ob obviously, a way that you can interact with uh, an AI is, is going to be something that we're all going to be doing in the near future. Um, and empathic uh, uh, soft skills uh, like Hume um, embedded into an AI are excellent. But at the end of the day, uh, I don't see a world where people just want to talk to only an AI. I just don't see that happening. We're still going to want to work with other people um, and have those creative uh, and awesome conversations um, that happen organically, naturally around the water cooler, uh, at the office, Friday drinks, when you're really, really engaged and really excited about something. These are the areas of where true innovation happens. And as much as AI is exceptionally good, uh, it definitely is not going to replace that that true innovation that comes from humans. Um, so really doubling down on those human soft skills and becoming really, really good at managing the strategic relationships in the product management space uh, is definitely something that I, I encourage product managers to do. Um, and as you can see with something like Hume, 
uh, you're once you have doubled down on those those kind of skill sets, you're going to be able to bring that into your product so that now you can engage with your customers with those skill sets and understand how to employ those soft skills in the way that you generate those products or create those products and apply that level of empathy and that level of uh, a, a kind of engagement to your end users. So I don't I don't see uh, the likes of Hume replacing AI, uh, uh, sorry, Hume AI replacing the likes of product managers in the future. Uh, most likely not. Um, ultimately, I think uh, there's still going to be a very human problem uh, going forward. And as PMs, um, if we have that skill set and that tool belt with all of our AI capabilities and knowing how these systems work and how this technology actually operates uh, and what tooling is available and how we leverage that, then uh, I think that we human is just another tool that we can leverage to really create great experiences for our, our end customers. Um, so I hope that that uh, I I'd love to have further conversations on those because those are great. Uh, but we'll we'll jump onto the next question there. So I've just uh, I've just lost a couple. As AI becomes more capable, will it take over strategic elements of product management? Uh, it looks like a Hume is a step in that direction. So just building on from that last question, um, yeah, I think look, I think that we're going to get to a place where AI is enabling us. Uh, in such a material way that we are just freed up to do these really human tasks. Um, at the end of the day, an AI can't shake my hand. It cannot give me a warm smile. It can't demonstrate body language. Um, and it can't make me feel an emotion like I would if I was having a great conversation with someone. It can mimic a lot of those things, but um, I'm not sure if anyone else has ever used any other AI-enabled product like Netflix's recommendation engine or TikTok. Um, it's it's not too long before it just becomes the same thing over and over again. Uh, and as such, you kind of get locked into these algorithm kind of um, uh, algorithmic kind of uh, echo chambers. Uh, and I think AI has the potential to kind of fall down that same trap. But ultimately, I do think that uh, the strategic elements of product management uh, is going to be uh, where most of our time is spent as product managers over the next few years. Uh, and into the future, just because it's going to allow us to really manage um, where and how those products are kind of coming to market and what they're looking like. Uh, and don't forget, in a world of commoditized software, um, where software is generated in near real time, um, we're going to see an incredible number of products. And as such, it may be a case of uh, some of the strategy is handled by the AI. But at the end of the day, I mentioned earlier, and I'll say it again, because it's so important there is no way to hold an AI accountable. The people making the AI are not going to take accountability for it. There's going to have to be someone within an organization that orchestrates and conducts what those AIs are doing and is ultimately held responsible for the outcome. Uh, and I think that that person is going to be the product manager and a lot of that is going to be kind of strategic. So I think that although we have this amazing kind of technology like Hume coming along, um, which enables us to understand human emotion and drive that human emotion, I genuinely believe that we're going to get to a place where um, the AI is not going to replace us in, in its entirety. Um, definitely not. Um, so I think there's another one here, uh, which is, will AI build products via templated modules so we can make the whole product quickly? Uh, yes and no, absolutely. I don't think template needs to be the thing um, in, in the future. I genuinely think that as AI increases in its capability and increases in its intelligence, uh, it's just going to be able to generate this stuff from the ground up. And really what it's going to come back to, if you look at product and the product design process and you break it up into a couple of key areas, um, it, you've got the kind of why. Why is there a problem and what is the problem? Um, and then you have uh, a second kind of area, which is like, what does the product do and what is it doing to solve that problem? And then you have the how, which is how are we building it? How are we executing it? What does it look like? Um, and if you think about product management in those three core categories, you've got the product kind of creation happening with AI down in the how. It's probably going to be like one or two AI enabled engineers um, that ultimately are held responsible Again, it comes back to that accountability, ultimately held responsible and accountable for the outcome of those AI uh, generating these products. 
but ultimately at the end of the day um what ai is is a commoditized intelligence and therefore it doesn't require templates it can def certainly use them if necessary but it's just going to be able to generate things from the ground up what's going to be absolutely essential is a very clear definition of what a product needs to do and it comes back to the uh the question a little earlier around that constraints in um in ip and and, and regulatory constraints that need to go into products um, ultimately, product managers are going to be responsible for ensuring that those 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 things are really well um, defined and really well um, articulated. And that's going to be a part of how we tie in that strategic overarching market uh, conditions to our tactical kind of these are the things that we need our product to do. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a really exciting time. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to play around with some of the the kind of AI tools that generate things, try and get ChatGPT to build you a game of Snake that you can run on your local machine. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. So uh, I definitely think we're going to get to a place where AI is building products really, really quickly. Um, so I've just completed, uh, jump, jump to the next question. Um, <clears throat> I've just completed the KC, uh, King's College London Product Management Accelerator course, just finished. Now interested in the AI aspects. Um, yep, as you should be. I think that's a great course of action. Um, once you have embedded that kind of knowledge into your into your kind of skill set, uh, then you can really start building out those 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 tools on your tool belt, uh, and that's really what these master classes are doing, uh, and what we're going to be working uh, on for the next kind of three uh, three of our our master class sessions here. Uh, and realistically, as you upskill and as you start learning how to wield these weapons of productivity. Uh, you're going to be able to create some really fantastic outcomes. Um, so good on you. Well done. Um, I think you're you're on the right track. I've got another question here from Heidi around, do we need an MBA to get into product management? Absolutely not. Um, I think that an MBA is exceptionally good for specific contexts, um, but <clears throat> I'm going to talk the counter case for a moment. And that is that um, right now, I think that we're at this inflection point with product management uh, where the more domain subject matter expertise you have in different areas, the better product manager you're going to be. The more you can understand your customer and really deeply empathize with their problem, the better a customer uh, product manager you're going to be. The more you can have really hard conversations and make them feel easy and effortless with your soft skills, the better a product management uh, manager you're going to be. Um, An MBA is excellent. It's a very, very good tool uh, for certain contexts, but it's absolutely not essential for product management in the future. Um, so folks, I think that has, that's all we've got time for today. Um, I think we're just going to wrap up uh, those questions. Thank you everyone for coming along. Um, very much appreciate the incredible questions and the, the fantastic uh, engagement from everyone. Um, make sure you join us uh, for our next masterclass session. Uh, it's going to be on the, the 30th of, uh, of, of the 7th. Um, and it's going to be with GT, who's going to be talking about how you can leverage AI to improve that productivity. So we've given you the high level functional um, understanding those foundational skills that you need to really understand how this technology is working, cut noise and uh, cut through the noise and get down to the truth. Uh, but now the next couple of sessions we're gonna be running, this is where we get into the nuts and bolts of how do you actually leverage these tools? How do you wield them uh, to create incredible outcomes? So be sure to join us. If you do have any questions, um, feel free to get in touch with the Fourth Rev team, contact them at kings at fourthrev.com. Um, and uh, make sure you, you come along because I am very, very excited for the next one. GT is an exceptional, exceptional product manager, and we all have a lot to learn. So um, until next time, guys, thank you very much for coming along. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you at our next in the Masterclass series uh, with 4th Rev. Thanks.